can happen that blocks you from accessing the customers for your ecosystem or can be hindrances for getting your innovation to the market. There are some things that you need to consider if there is an ecosystem in play that you will have to access and use to, to be able to get your products or services out there. Let's start with some repetition. As you remember, customers often have a market alternative, a product or service they use today. So what you offer is only the benefit relative to what they already have. That's the added value there, the added benefit. The added value actually is smaller because they also have switching costs, risks, problems, the whole hassle of going through the process and replacing what they're already doing. The relative benefits is squeezed from the bottom and is squeezed from the top as well. And what you have here is a value delta. Okay, so whenever we think about going out there with our nice little thingy, and uh, we think we have a lot of added value, we have to do a reality check. How much does it take for the customer also to change from something that is already pretty good, or at least not really, really bad, to our thing that might be better? Do we have a compelling argument here? So the value delta is important. It's critical. Now, it plays different roles in different situations. The ecosystem is a bit special because we have many different actors and especially for those that are in what's called the adoption chain that we'll come back to. It becomes a little bit more important to find exactly who are now involved and make sure that all benefit. So we have in the ecosystem, we have a value structure, we have roles. And when you put the roles together, you get the relationship that we call a value network here. And if you want to create a unicorn and not just some business that struggles, uh, you really want to be able to be creative and how you put the functions together and how you distribute them over actors. Role reconfiguration is really what, what the disruption of an industry looks like. That's the result. Someone comes in and takes over some functions, makes others redundant, and some roles really goes out completely, and the others get completely different conditions. So this is how it will play out. There are some patterns on how digital platforms disrupt industries that you can read in this chapter that is mentioned here. But generally speaking, you know, it is about doing the function with a different asset and activity base. There's Essentially, three things you need to accomplish when you try to put your product or service on the market. One thing that you need to do always is to look at some sort of execution risk that we have even if we're not in an ecosystem. But if we're in an ecosystem, we have two additional problems. One is the interdependence problem or the interdependence risk that for our service to work, there needs to be something else in place also. And maybe that is not in place yet. Or maybe we need to persuade, for example, the platform to add some function so we can sell our product or service. So some other innovations need to happen. That is really an obstacle for us. We need to have a plan for that if that's the case. And the other thing that might happen is that we will have to have other actors connected to the customer or to the chain to the customer that need to adopt our product or service. So we'll take examples here from a book called The Wide Lens. First, we'll look at the co-innovation risk. The problem with the co-innovation risk is to realize the full value of our innovation, the customers must also have other stuff. We need to see if there are things missing or that needs to be at least changed that are required as complementary and enabling functions. We need to be able to think about the odds for it to happen, right? And decide, is this the right strategy? Or we go back and redo the strategy. And uh, for example, there was a number of companies inventing really nice, small MP3 players. 
but they were not making a big hit. What was needed was, first of all, the broadband connections were really bad. In most places there were dial-up connections. Downloading songs was really not fun. And then there was no way to source songs legally. You know, it was difficult to get that portable player to get widespread adoption. The sales were small. And that went on for a couple of years. When Apple did it, they did the co-innovation of iTunes. So you can really get a huge library to choose from and pay for songs and you get them downloaded. So that solved a huge adoption problem. And then, of course, meanwhile, over those years, uh, the uh, better connectivity was also quickly spreading. So co-innovations were necessary. In this case, Apple did the co-innovation of iTunes themselves, and then they got to own the revenue point for the music, not only the player. And then the other one, uh, fixing that people have broadband access, they sort of waited for that to happen. But then the market was ready, and then they came in with a nice-looking thing with access to a million songs or whatnot. I don't know how much it was in the beginning. And that was a huge hit. So whenever you thinking about a product or service, you need to map the ecosystem based on the value structure, the functions. What functions are needed here? The things that are not in place, you estimate the probability for them to be in place. If you have three innovations that are needed and they're all at 80%, What is the combined likelihood here? It's around just over 0.5 because probabilities they multiply, so it becomes very little. One weak point really breaks the whole thing. So you can go in and support the actor here that is supposed to do this, help them, increase the odds, or you can try to make that part also yourself. This is how you calculate the odds. It is really, really good if you identify the weak points before you start to build your factory to produce your MP3 players. So for the adoption chain, you can have a weak link. So we have this everybody on board in the ecosystem. So we have an innovator, distributor, retailer, end customers, and maybe platform owners, complementary service providers, and so on. And even if it's great value for the end customer, right, and other parts of the system, it can really revolutionize their operations and, and their business. If some part here is missing, it will not be able to work. It's not that there is a piece of functionality that is missing. It's more that the incentive is not there for some of the actors. They are not making any money. Uh, so why should they why should they bother so for example if you build Tesla you make electric cars and they are fancy but how do you sell them you can't sell them with car dealers because if you go to car dealers around the world and say hey sell our Teslas they'll say sorry we will not make more money on your cars and maybe Ford and Mercedes will stop delivering to us if we take in your competing product so they don't have an incentive. So in this case, Tesla built their own retail. That's why you had Tesla stores in department stores. They put them where people were, not in the suburbs. So you can really go there and see it. And they really had to do it somehow, you know, because, because they cannot get into the channels that were available for other car makers. Now we map the value network. We calculate the value proposition for each action, including adoption cost and risk that we talked about earlier. And we find weak links and core issues blocking for our innovation to get to the market. And if we find some of these, what can we do? Well, if there is a technical element blocking us, let's say we have a much better dentist drill. It's costly for some reason. We might not be able to sell it everywhere. Maybe you can go for specialist dentists or 
you know, the dental surgeons at, at big hospitals or something like that. So we try to find a niche. And in that niche, everybody makes, makes a plus. Or you can go around maybe the, the actor, like Tesla did. They built their own retail. Or the third case is that you do some sort of a financial innovation and distribute the value from the others to the one that is not winning so much. So in this uh, Wide Lens book, there is a case with uh, the cinema industry. So we were able to make video in digital, but then it was printed on films and we sent the films around the world. And uh, a, a problem was that for the cinema to upgrade to the digital projectors and all that, it was quite a big cost and they didn't, didn't do anything for the revenues. The movie producers saved a lot of money because they didn't have to print expensive films and do the logistics and so on. I think this calculation was that for every film that they had to print a copy and that was like $6,000 or something. Uh, so they invented like a, a virtual clipping fee. And then there was uh, an organization for invented for the movie industry where they took some of the revenues from the cinemas as a clipping fee and then they sponsored them to get uh, the equipment to be able to transition. So you can create some sort of a system that transfers some of the costs or you know, spread out the revenues a little bit better or more evenly. And that can help get your innovation adopted by the actors necessary. Two lectures that we have left on the ecosystem theme. They, they, they relate to the creation and change, these structures. <laughs>